thank you very much for coming. <coughs> so, so basically, we are supposed to take this talk together, me and Casper, but uh, when Casper saw the results of our benchmarks, uh, he got sick and he, <laughs> he couldn't make it to, to come here to, to San Francisco, but uh, still was, he was very enthusiastic about the, about the talk. So uh, we, we managed to do this together and we will try. Uh, hopefully it will work out. Uh, so our, our topic, uh, my name is Ludwig Bukowski. I'm software developer. Uh, Katzper, can you introduce uh, yourself as well? Of course, sure. So my name is Kacper Mental. Uh, I'm speaking from Poland, from a small town near Piaskobiała. I'm, I'm the developer in Erlang Solutions and I work together with Ludwig. Yeah, great. Uh, so the idea for the talk is that <laughs> let's assume that uh, I, I have a startup and I'm making an application and my application will, will include some machine learning. So uh, it imposes some number crunching. And uh, I have like mobile devices that uh, like sends requests to my application and I need to hand, uh, handle like, like very huge load and each request will involve some computations. So, so it's some machine learning idea. Uh, we have this uh, expectation that we will go below like 100 milliseconds per, per request. And uh, we have this choice that we can choose the technology and uh, we have Scala and Elixir. Uh, we chose the Scala because it's like fancy name and we heard that it's scalable and Elixir just because we are Elixir developers. So uh, yeah, we, we are just choosing between those two technologies. The idea is that we make the application in both of them. We make a test and we compare the performance. So those are just our assumptions for, for our uh, talk. So we have came up with an exemplary problem uh, that um, reflects uh, to some extent, of course, uh, any machine learning problems. So we, the problem that we have, choose, we have chosen is uh, recognizing handwritten digit, which is uh, pretty uh, intensive when it comes to CPU usage task. And in order to see which technology fits better uh, to our problem. Uh, so once, our, once we build our applications, two applications, uh, we, can, we can test uh, which of them performs better. Uh, so here you can see on this slide, you can see the screenshot of our web UI of our application. You can just draw a digit in this white space and our application will guess, will recognize what digit you uh, you draw. So basically, with here we draw four, and the guessing were successful, and we can we can see that the application recognized that digit as four. From more technical perspective, our application exposes uh, slash letters HTTP API uh, when you can post an array of zeros and ones that represents um, the, 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 the digit that you draw. And that the endpoint just returns recognized digit. Uh, so for approaching the problem from more uh, like technical perspective, uh, we used uh, KNN algorithm. So it's K nearest neighbors uh, algorithm. Uh, just like brief introduction to the how it works. Uh, it's like very simple and straightforward. Uh, the idea is this is the, just the vis visual imp like visualization of the problem. Uh, let's uh, assume that our star in the middle is our handwritten digit. Uh, the orange dots represent some uh, reference samples of, of written like five, and the blue one are representing the four. So the idea is that we measure the distance between our sample our uh, data we provide with uh, reference we, could, we can call them training data uh, then we chose only the mm, like k nearest examples so in our uh, picture it will be like the circle with radius k uh, equals to three uh, and we can see that like let's say this is what i written is more similar to to number five because we have two samples 
uh, two like orange samples in the circle and one blue. Uh, so that's that's our like the, the idea for how it works. Uh, in our implementations for representing digits, we used uh, for for Elixir we used lists, and for Scala we used uh, array collections, and each input is represented by 1,024 uh, binary values. So we can see it's like two different uh, fours, uh, and this is what is being sent to the server. Uh, this is the example how we calculate the distance between those samples. So on the left side we have input vector. On the right side, we have the, the reference sample. So we like compare each the, the number on each position. So it's like zero compared with zero. So the distance is still zero. At some point, we have like on the left side we have zero, and on the right we have one. So we have to add one to our distance. And once we iterate all over the samples uh, for that particular uh, like input and reference sample, we have like the 203 uh, distance. So let's say we have another sample, so it's different for. Uh, the distance is a bit more, it's like 257. And when we compare it with like five, the, it's much more, it's like more than 300. So we can say that uh, generally our f like digit which we have written is more similar to, to four. Uh, to sum up, we used uh, more than 2,000 uh, reference samples, so it means that uh, there were more, more than 2 million operation per request because uh, we have 1,000 binary values per input that have to be multiplied by uh, 2,000 reference samples. And we use the, the k in the algorithm, the parameter k equals to, to 15. Uh, so we have the Scala and we have the Elixir. Uh, so quick reminder about those two technologies. The Scala is uh, object-oriented programming with some functional paradigms. Uh, it's statically typed and uh, it runs on uh, JVM. On the, other, uh, on, the, on the other side we have Elixir, which is functional programming language. It's dynamically typed and it runs on Beam Virtual Machine. Uh, for our Scala application, uh, we used uh, Akka HTTP server uh, with version uh, 10.1.9 on Scala 2.13.1. Uh, we use SprayJSON parser, and uh, the, the implementation is based on the futures. So, which basically means when you like go through the documentation, it maps to the Java thread pool, which could be mapped to the uh, POSIX thread pool. So the Mm, what's worth mentioning here that, uh, that the future, once it's called within one thread, it might be executed in another one. So it might imply some context switchings between uh, the threads. And for Elixir? Yes, for Elixir, we used uh, Phoenix version 1.4.9 on Elixir 1.9. Uh, for parsing JSON, we use just JSON parser. Uh, uh, the distance calculation between two vectors, between the between our between the sum between two samples, uh, were implemented using task async stream, which basically means that each distance each single distance calculation was calculated in a separate Erlang process. Um, it turned out uh, later that when we just uh, used. Um, like fixed size process pool, it slightly improved the performance. But the the idea of ASIC string ASIC async stream was uh, some kind uh, analogical to what we have in Scala. Uh, when it comes to um, our uh, benchmark infrastructure, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, we wanted to to test these two implementations and compare the results. We wanted to be as close to real world infrastructure as possible. So we decided to use AWS for our tests. And the diagram on this slide shows what our load test infrastructure looked like. Like each of the rectangles are just EC2 instances. So we have one EC2 instance for our application server. We have some other instances for our load generators. We used AMOC. Uh, Amog is just a uh, load testing tool written in Erlang 
that uh, supports massively parallel load tests. Um, AMOC has a concept of a user, which is basically an Erlang process underneath. Uh, and each user follows a certain scenario. So in our case, uh, an AMOC user translates just to HTTP client. So each of these users uh, sends an HTTP request to the server. So basically, each, each user sends uh, HTTP POST request to our slash letters uh, API. Uh, so coming to the results, this is uh, in our um, presentation, we'll keep to the convention when we have here the specification. So for that part particular test, it was a large machine on AWS, uh, eight cores and 100 requests per second uh, generated. Uh, I have put like red marks so that it's more visible. Uh, the, the first chart is the response time. So it's like latency from the like client perspective what is measured. The upper one is the 99th percentile, and the, the, this, this one uh, down is uh, the mean of the request. All the requests that comes to, to our application written in Scala. Uh, here we have uh, queries per minute. So for that graph, we have 2.2 case uh, requests per minute. And uh, on the right side, we have the CPU usage measured on the like tested machine. So those two graphs are from the client perspective, and this CPU is uh, like AWS metrics uh, exposed. Uh, so short comment on that: we, for Scala Vanilla version with uh, 100 requests per second, we were able like to have around like average two seconds response with uh, like five seconds, more than five seconds of 99th percentile. Uh, we. We didn't manage to like generate all the load because we had like all the CPU was uh, uh, consumed, so there were no space for additional requests. That's the reason we have not six thousand six case, but just two case uh, of the request. But this is just like first uh, approach uh, we did. So how about the Elixir? So for Elixir. Uh, for the same specification as for the first uh, Scala test, which means eight uh, cores and 100 requests per second, uh, response times are about uh, 50 seconds. Uh, we, we were only able to uh, handle uh, 100 to 120 uh, requests uh, per minute. Uh, and um, so basically, uh, to wrap it up, Scala was almost tame, 10 times faster in the first round, but um, it's known fact that Elixir is not, is not the, fastest, the fastest technology for number crunching. Uh, and of course, we can optimize that. The, one of the ways we can do that is to delegate the heaviest, uh, the heaviest computations to our to external program written in C. But how could we do that? So the answer, like the first answer that we come up with was the write the port, uh, C port. So the, the idea is that we uh, like move the, all the computation to the external executable that we run. But it's not run within the Erlang virtual machine, but it's just separate Unix process. And we communicate with this process uh, through the I.O. So we can have the bottleneck there. And this approach is quite safe because once our program in C crash, it does not like goes down our, our machine with Erlang. And so it's like separate process. Uh, it might be worth to use pooling in that technique because in our case, uh, one port was not enough. So we had to have a pool uh, of the, of the pro processes. Uh, so how looks the results now? we were able to go to two seconds and dot eight and two dot six. So it's 99th percentile around two seconds from 50 seconds. Uh, and the mean is uh, two dot six. Uh, we can observe as well that there is a small difference between the mean and the 99th percentile. Uh, we were able to generate just one dot six K requests. So a little, still a bit less than uh, Scala. Uh, so 
we are much closer to the Scala performance. We, we observe the significant speed up. Uh, and the, the CPU is not fully utilized, but uh, our, our hypothesis is that it's because of the overhead of uh, I.O. operations. But uh, can we go even like faster? That was our question. So the answer is yes, we can. Uh, so we can use something that is called NIF, natively implemented functions. We can think of it as a part of the of such functions. We can think like they are the like they are part of the BIM itself. So it the so NIF should be faster than port because there are no I/O operations. We can call C code directly from Erlang, just like a regular Erlang functions. But we have to be extremely careful when using NIF because once NIF uh, crashes, it can crash the whole virtual machine. And also, uh, Erlang scheduler does not preempt a NIF. So uh, it might be a situation that a NIF hogs the, the whole scheduler and blocks all the other processes from using that particular scheduler. So it might disrupt uh, soft real-time properties of our system. So when it comes to, to the results, uh, we can see that the response times are blazingly fast. A min is about 20 milliseconds, while 99th percentile is 30 milliseconds. So we were able to handle 100 requests per second easily. Uh, just to uh, remind you that this is the, the exactly the same the same machine as we used in the first test, so eight cores and 100 requests per second. Uh, so, um, as I said, we were able to easily handle 100 requests per second. CPU consumption was uh, between 26 to 20 to 28 um, percent. So we we wondered. Uh, if we could improve the results even more by using, for example, more powerful machine. Um, so we ran another test with uh, 16 cores machine, uh, 100 requests per second. Uh, the results are almost the same. Uh, of course, CPU usage is, is lower, is about 5%. Um, but the response times are almost the same. But we wanted to know how how that implementation behaves under bigger load because there were still plenty of CPU available. So we ran another test with uh, 36 cores machine, but one but with 1,000 requests per second. Um, so response times were still very very good it was the res response times were a bit higher but still still very good like min was 25 milliseconds 99th percentile 32 milliseconds uh, we were able to handle all the requests and cpu utilization was about 70 uh, percent so we could handle even more requests uh, so w one can say that it's it's fine, it's okay that we are like optimizing Elixir all the time. So we had this idea: if can we do the same in Scala? So can we move the computation uh, like to native code uh, in Scala? Uh, and the answer is yes. There's something called uh, the Java native uh, interface. Uh, so it basically does what NIFS does. So you can just you have interface that you can use and write some code in C or other languages and uh, basically speed up the, the application. So uh, our, last, uh, our first approach uh, didn't go very well. Uh, we ended up with like, not a very meaningful error. Uh, it's, it's just killed. So, and it ended up like two minutes. Uh, the reason is uh, we needed to look in, in the kernel. Uh, kernel logs. Uh, it was out of memory uh, exception. So, the, like generally, the, the solution is that we ended up with uh, it's like the lesson that you have to release resources once you uh, create them in C. Uh, so just like keep in mind that it can like crash your whole application as well. 
So it's like similar case like with NIF. Uh, anyway, we, we, ab we are able to fix that. And uh, this is our results. We are coming to our like first machine. So it's just eight cores. Eight, eight cores and uh, we see that we have six milliseconds as a 99th percentile and three milliseconds as a mean. So it's very fast. I mean, it's uh, faster than uh, our NIF implementation. Uh, we were able to cover 6K requests and uh, just ut utilized 6% of our uh, machine. Uh, then we decided to check the performance on, on the biggest machine we had. So it was uh, 36 cores. Uh, and uh, it turned out that actually we can improve the results. Uh, as as a, like uh, interesting fact, we can observe in the beginning that uh, we have very big uh, like like hype for Scala, and our hypothesis is that it is just something called just in time compiler. So the the Java virtual machine needs to warm up, but after that the response times go very very low. Uh, yeah, so we are able to generate 30k uh, requ requests per minute and we are utilizing 28% uh, of, of the machine uh, using the Java native interface. So the computations are moved to the native code. Uh, so we came up with another question that couldn't we just avoid all this native code and just increase the, the machines and compare if Elixir or Scala is, is the, which, which one is the proper tool? Uh, so What's the answer for Elixir? So for Elixir, we probably could not avoid using native code to have some reasonable response times. Uh, the diagram at the top shows results of the test with, uh, let's say, vanilla version uh, on 36 core machine with uh, 100 requests per second. So we can see that the mean is about 20 seconds and the 99th percentile is about 25 seconds. So when you compare it to the, <clears throat> to the diagram uh, at the bottom, uh, which shows uh, 100 requests per second, but on an eight core machine, uh, we can see that the improvement is like, uh, the response times are two times uh, lower on the on the bigger machine, but it's still 20 seconds. It's not acceptable like for HTTP requests. So the answer is is no. Probably we could not avoid using native C implementation uh, for Elixir. Uh, for Scala, the answer is that we actually could uh, when we compare the um, the machine of eight cores that was used in the beginning on the bottom with. 60, if 36 cores machine, uh, but still the vanilla version, so no native code. Uh, we can see that the like, improvement is very significant. So it's like 10 and 10 uh, milliseconds for mean and 20 milliseconds for uh, 99th percentile. So it's something that we can accept in our system. Uh, yeah, so it worked for Scala. Uh, to sum up uh, our, our work, uh, we can say that both Scala and Elixir native code will improve uh, your application performance. Uh, both Scala and Elixir native code can crash your machine, so you have, you have to be very careful. Uh, and for that particular problem we used, uh, Scala implementation was, uh, had just lower latencies there than Elixir one. But we'd like to highlight that that was a particular problem we chosen, and there are different aspects, I think, for other talks, like, like syntax, like development, like speed of the, uh, like writing the code. So this is just what we compared. We just compared the performance and number crunching in both technologies. Uh, another conclusion we have is like uh, adding more cores not always improve the performance. So. Uh, it's like you cannot do this forever, but I think there are some theoretical proofs for that as well. Uh, and another one is that like we felt that writing a native impl implementation is not really hard. 
we will we managed to do this like in one day for each so it wasn't that scary as we thought in the beginning so we, we recommend that you can try it as well uh, this is all what we had prepared today thank you very much Questions? We didn't have anything in the database. I mean, we fetched them to the memory, all the reference examples before doing this, and we tried to avoid like coping the uh, like the list between between the processes, for instance. So we tried to minimize it very, very much. And uh, I'm not sure if there is any over because the, before we did this, we made some uh, like using Xproof. Like Peter is working on that, and we measured what is actually slowing down the application. And it turned out that actually that was the operations of like making a difference between zero and ones. So it wasn't about decoding, serialization, and enco encoding. So we like made sure before making those benchmarks, and then we made it and measured just to end-to-end -end metrics. But it's I think valuable uh, like not note that. Uh, you have to keep in mind other aspects, not only the calculations. Yeah, th um, along those lines, um, I think we some experiments made a year ago and are like the fastest way to process two binaries of the same length and, and compare the bits. Um, and there was a big difference in how you, how you did it. Lists were a lot slower than binaries. Processing it as a binary or as a list? It is a list. We we wanted to make it as a list because we we knew that binaries might be have some optimizations. So we, we assume that this is just the, the problem, like some problem, but we assume that if you have like more complex issue to solve, you will end up to, to work on list at some point. So you don't have always binaries because there are not much operations you can do with binaries. I mean we could we could no, but it's an operation. Yeah, I mean, if, if you consider this particular problem, you could actually have b binary both sides and do the XOR operation mm -hmm. for that particular problem. And XOR would work here, actually, because y you would have the differences. But this is the solution just for our key NN. If you had something more complex like neural networks, uh, you would end up with some number crunching. So this is, th this is our uh, like approach. So we, we didn't optimize that particular problem. We just had some problem that we want to solve. And we optimize everything around. So for instance, moving the, the computations into native code in, in C. You could, it could be done in, in Rust. I think David had the talk yesterday about Rustler. So you can write an if in Rust as well. It's even, even better, I think. Does, does it answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it's not promoted or like this. Or, because this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really view this as number crunching. If you had the, if you had the two binaries and XOR them, I suspect you could probably improve the performance by orders of magnitude. Yeah, maybe. Or I don't know. That's just my guess. Yeah, but as I say, if you have something different, not just difference, but maybe some 
more complex operation, maybe not everything could be done with binaries. But yeah, I, I get your point. I get your point that it could be done like this as well. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know what it is about? You have like a tool that sort of like wonders maybe about the VM that makes that makes people like adding new experiences really slow. Mm okay, cool. Is there like an approximate to that or like what what it is about the VM that makes some of these operations slower than maybe you would hope? Mm yeah, I mean we didn't dig up why. But it could be anything. It's, it could be like. I mean, the function that was doing this was taking the most of the time. And, and the function was iterating all over the list. Actually, it was, I think, a zipped list and doing all those operations. I didn't. I didn't like profile exact operation of ad ad addition, but I profiled the whole function that does all this stuff. So I was sure that there's nothing more. Casper uh, is not responding because he doesn't hear you guys, just me, so he's just making the serious face. <laughs> 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 yeah, another one. Yeah. You mean memory or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we had all of those metrics. We had the memory, we had CPU, 99th percentile, 95th mean, everything. But we consider that CPU is important because memory is quite stable all the time. And we compared mean and 99th because most of the applications have those like uh, requirements that we want 99th percentile to be low. I could put everything on the slide, but it might go a bit uh, obscured, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, we, we had it and like it behaves similar. So 99 was similar as 95, uh, memory was rather stable, nothing like special happening. We even did some tests with IO operations included between so that we print out something on the screen and do computation and print out and the, the performance went worse for both Scala and Elixir. Because we initially thought maybe Elixir will handle it better, but uh, in some, some tests it, it didn't. Yeah? Um, I don't know if I'm not sure if the question will be answered, but if you use list or split Scala and Elixir, I understand that they both improve, but is list just a case for the DDT regarding Scala or Elixir? <laughs> that is a good argument. It's like uh, you use Erlang for uh, like messenger, for message passing as a middleware. I mean, I think s some people use the word coordinator. And the like, the logic that requires computation, you move to the C. So, for instance, the C there is only like let's say some neural networks prediction, but all the business logic, like how to handle the queries, how to like write the HTTP server, everything is then in in Erlang. And I think the companies do it this way. But that's a good point. In the end, you could write everything in C, but it would be a nightmare to maintain and uh, read. That's that's true. You have to have like this, like. Something between. Uh, yeah, assembly, yeah. <laughs> yeah? How did you configure your uh, your dirty scheduler? Uh, it's I think dirty schedulers are not run on the NIF. Maybe this is a uh, question to Casper. Casper, do you remember if the NIFs are on or dirty schedulers? Or it was on yeah, usual? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I believe you can use dirty schedulers for running a new, but we didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we were considering that optimization, but we didn't. So, like the whole NIF was run like atomically, so it wasn't preempted. Uh, 
in between. But this is uh, good. And actually, that was I think that was the only operations that we were doing basically. I mean that we. I'm not sure that we can block something else. Like this was only the one thing that we are doing mo mo mostly. All right. Anything else? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right.